So what you're left with is two types of motion. Uh, parallel here, I just mean parallel to the magnetic field. So the, the, the particle, the guiding center of the particle is streaming along the magnetic field at some velocity. And uh, interestingly enough, it's drifting across the magnetic field uh, with some E cross B drift. So this is called E cross B drift. I imagine most of you have seen this before. Um, this is actually what underlies MHD, is that all the particles, uh, independent of their species, you notice there's no charge here, there's no mass here, you know. Independent of the species, all the particles are E cross B drifting. And this is what underlies um, MHD, is that this flow in MHD is ordered with the sound speed, which means it's a fast drift, and this is what gives you uh, alphane waves and things like this. Good. So we have a particle ex executing Larmor motion about a, a guiding center. That guiding center is just running straight along the magnetic field. And as it does so, it's performing these E cross B drifts. Um, and I have some magnetic field that's out of the board. You know, I just orient it this way because it's easy to take cross products. Um, normally, without the electric field, uh, this thing is just going to execute Larmor motion, right? So it's just going to go in a circle. Um, if I pick a particular charge, it's going to go in a particular direction. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to label four points of interest in the orbit. So if there were no electric field, the particles just execute Larmor motion, and that's exactly what it would look like. Now, if you include the electric field, um, this particle is going to get accelerated because electric fields accelerate uh, charges. So as that particle is executing its Larmor motion, once it, once it leaves point number one, it's going to get accelerated by the electric field because it's going in the direction of the, the electric field. And what you need to remember is that the Larmor radius, uh, or the gyro radius of a particle, is V perp divided by omega. So omega here is just fixed, right? Because we have a homogeneous constant magnetic field. But this is not going to be fixed, because this particle is sitting uh, in an accelerating electric field. So as this particle goes this way and it starts to get accelerated, its Larmor radius is going to grow. And so instead of coming back here, like in that diagram, it's going to have a larger Larmor radius. So here's, here's the new point now. So from 1 to 2, uh, V perp goes, goes up because you're accelerating because of the electric field. Now, as that particle comes back down this way, now it's fighting, it's fighting uphill, right? So it's trying to go against the flow, uh, and it starts to slow down. So in going from 2 to 3, V perp starts to slow down, which means that the Larmor radius starts to shrink. Right, so instead of having this large circle, I'll complete that one, it starts to shrink. So now it's all the way down here. So you notice it's drifted. Right? It's not, it's not going to close back on the, on the circle at which it started. As it comes back up, it's going to start getting accelerated again by the electric field. And so the Larmor race is going to start to grow because V perp is going up. And then you're just going to have a cycle like this. And it'll just keep on going. And you know, lo and behold, whip out your, your right hand. And this is the E cross B direction. <clears throat> so this is absolutely crucial in MHD. It underlies uh, the perpendicular dynamics of the particles. Uh, it's what's behind things like alphane waves. Um, it's the E cross B drift. And in MHD, this is um, the dominant drift uh, in the system. So whether it's an ion or electron, it'll have a different Larmor scale, right? Because the masses are different of the particles. 
but they'll all be drifting in the same direction, which means that the E-cross B drifts introduce no current. Right, so adiabatic invariance. <coughs> So these are associated with some sort of periodic motion. <clears throat> um, that the particles undergo. And you know, we've already talked about one sense of periodic motion, which is just that the Larmor radius of the particle sweeps around in a circle with some gyrophase that's time dependent. So that's one type of motion that's periodic in the system. And that's just in, induced by having a strong magnetic field, strong enough so that these Larmor motions um, are fast. Uh, there's another periodic sense of, mag, uh, of, uh, of motion that's induced by the magnetic field. And that's associated with these drifts. So suppose the guiding center somehow, um, while it's executing these drifts, it might get reflected and bounce back and forth. Uh, in some sort of magnetic bottle, which I'll, I'll draw a picture of. You know, that's another sense of periodic motion. And for each of these periodic motions, there's some adiabatic uh, quantity that's associated with this periodic motion, which is approximately conserved. So that's what I'll talk about now. So the first adiabatic invariant we've already written down on the board. It's just the magnetic moment of the particle. Um, so general form of adiabatic invariance, you know, in classical mechanics speak, it looks like this. There's some canonical momentum and there's some generalized coordinate that's associated with it. And you're taking this integral over some sort of periodic loop. Um, so in this case, the momentum is just the angular momentum of a particle as it executes Larmor motion. And the, um, the coordinate that's associated with that is just this gyro phase. So you've got uh, a particle going around. It's got some angular momentum, mv times the Larmor radius. And there's some sort of angular coordinate that's associated with that uh, periodic motion, which is called the gyro phase. So here's a magnetic field. It's into the plane of the board. And suppose I have some particle um, that's doing that. So the question would be, Let's see, yeah, I'll do this. The question here is what happens to this particle if I very slowly weaken the magnetic field? So may I just expand it a little bit? What I mean by slowly is suppose I go from this configuration of the field to this configuration field on a time scale much longer than the particle executes its Larmor motion. And that's where the term adiabatic comes in, right? You have to do this slowly. What will happen? Well, you can you know, integrate this orbit using conservation of the magnetic moment. And what you'll see is that the, per the uh, perpendicular velocity of the particle will adjust. It'll decrease. So if B goes down, V perp has to go down. So this is roughly a constant. Another reason why I draw it like this is that um, you can count the number of field lines that threaded this Larmor orbit, and you see that they're the same. So the particles like to conserve the amount of flux that's flowing through a Larmor uh, orbit. So you can think about this thing two ways. You can think about it as just conserving flux in the Larmor orbit, or you can think about it in terms of just conservation of angular momentum of, of a particle. In the notes, that I, I just I proved that it's conserved mathematically. And I apply it to something called math, uh, magnetic mirroring, which I think is something that's going to show up in, in uh, Professor Barnes' talk, um, I think, tomorrow.
Deep within their roiling clouds, thunderstorms hold an elusive surprise. Under just the right conditions, they produce some of the highest energy radiation naturally found on Earth. Terrestrial gamma ray flashes, or TGFs for short. Studies by NASA's Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope have shown that TGFs fire up about 1,100 times a day. Now, new research combines Fermi detections with ground-based radar and lightning location data. These studies show that TGFs come from more diverse types of storms than previously thought. In a thunderstorm, collisions among rain and snow cause different parts of the cloud to develop positive and negative electrical charges. When the strength of the electric field overcomes the insulating properties of air in the thundercloud, a lightning flash occurs. Most lightning occurs entirely within the cloud and is called an intra-cloud flash. All lightning produces a strong and sudden change in the storm's electric field, but the upward portion of an intra-cloud flash sometimes sends a surge of electrons rushing toward the upper part of the storm. Reaching speeds nearly as fast as light, these accelerated electrons give off gamma rays when their paths are deflected by air molecules. Using global lightning location networks, scientists can determine the TGF position more accurately than with Fermi data alone. Two dozen localized TGFs occurred within areas covered by next-generation weather radar systems. This gives scientists the opportunity to begin studying the kinds of storms that produce TGFs. These slices of radar data capture different types of storms encompassing a wide range of updraft strengths. Even the weakest of them produced a TGF. Another finding, TGFs seem to occur in the same altitude range, between seven and nine miles high. Lightning can form at much lower altitudes, so there's every reason to think TGFs can too. But gamma rays from TGFs occurring deeper in the atmosphere are greatly weakened. They're too dim for Fermi to detect which probably means the satellite is undercounting them. Thank <laughs> you.